so today is uh, Tuesday, March 9th. The daily quiz for today is quiz number 12. Uh, please answer that on grade scope by 11.59 p.m. tonight. Uh, at the same time, you have your homework 6 that is due on grade scope. I have posted a new homework, homework 7, that is due next Tuesday. So you have a week to work on that. Uh, now, a special note regarding homework 7, there is a, a video that I have, uh, video recording that I have made available in the homework. And I want you guys to uh, review that lecture material um, at maybe 2x speed, whatever whatever you want to set it at on YouTube. Um, so you, you have a chance to watch that uh, over the course of uh, the, the this week and next week. And as you have questions uh, about the material, please ask me uh, during office hours or on Piazza on, or on WebEx Teams. Um, this is just done so that we keep up with our uh, course schedule. So I'm not going to do that uh, many times uh, over the semester. I plan to do that only twice. And one of them is for homework 7 and another lecture for homework 8. And that is it. In terms of studio, your studio three is uh, due tomorrow. Uh, so make sure that you get checked off as well as submit a report on Gradescope. The next studio, studio four has been posted. Um, and uh, I have seen some of you guys have, uh, you have already started working on it. Uh, it is due uh, next Wednesday, so March 17th. Um, and from my experience, students who finish studio three and understand uh, studio 3 very well get done with studio 4 pretty quickly uh, so you have a, that that's the reason why there is just a, a week in the middle uh, but when I release studio 5 then th there might be a little bit more time for studio 5 questions or concerns at this time Okay, let's move on. So we have been talking about decoders. Let's continue that discussion. And in fact, we will move on, we will talk about even the encoders today. So this is what we were doing in the last class. We said, all right, what does a decoder supposed to do? Well, it should decode. So if you give it a code, maybe in BCD or maybe just straight up binary, it should convert that into a decoded output. And that decoded output could be something like one of the outputs becoming active. So there are three sets of inputs to this. Oh, sorry, three sets of inputs and outputs to this. One is a bunch of inputs that could be qualifying as a code, bunch of outputs, that is the decoded output. And then you may have several enable inputs. And we'll see examples today of how we can use enables uh, in a very uh, nice way to cascade decoders. They are generally of the form n to 2 raised to n. We, was, we started talking about the 2 to 4 decoder and then we will move on to the 3 to 8 and 4 to 16 decoder today. This again is from last class. We wrote a truth table for a 2 to 4 decoder. We had two active high inputs, i1 and i0. We had four active high outputs, Y0 through Y3, and we also included a active high enable signal. Everything was active high. Based on the true table, we wrote logic expressions for all the outputs, and then we tried to express these logic functions in the form of enable and a specific min term. And we did that for y0, y1, y2, y3. So what happened was, in, in, if you if you were to write a general expression for say y sub k, the kth active high output, you would write it as enable and min term k, right? So you see y0 is enable and min term 0, y1 enable and min term 1, and so on. So in general, 
if you had k outputs, then you would say yk, the kth output, active high output is enabled and min term number k. And then we said, all right, what if we wanted active low outputs? What would we have to do to get y0 underscore l instead of y0? We just had to complement the outputs in order to do that. And we when we complemented the outputs, enable became enable underscore l and active low enable. And the min term became the max term. So for y0, y1, y2, y3, all of them, when you express them in terms of an active low output, you get enable underscore L or the corresponding max term, max term zero, max term one, max term two, max term three. So in this case, we had inputs being active high, outputs we made active low, and while we were doing act outputs in the output, uh, active low form, form, we also made the enable as active low. So it is active when it is low. I want the decoder to be enabled when I make it low. And based on that, we uh, modified our truth table a little bit for the output uh, outputs being active low. So it's the same truth tra tra table as before. We still have an enable, but in this case, we have a active low enable. So all the ones and the zeros are swapped. Inputs are still active high, so those two columns remained as is. And then we had the four outputs represented in active low form, so all the zeros and ones were flipped. And this it, uh, it this happens to be half of the 74X139 chip. So where is the other half? Well, there are two of them, right? So in this 74X139 chip, you all actually have two uh, two to four decoders. We'll, we'll see the, the diagrams in just a bit. This is, uh, this should be review, right? So this slide presents you a block diagram of the two to four decoder, enables, uh, sorry, inputs and outputs. Everything active high. This is something that we have uh, written out and discussed in detail before. And now you can, based on your expressions, you can actually make it, right, using logic symbols. So if you take the logic expressions, this is not for the uh, outputs being active low. This is for outputs being active high. So everything is active high here. Uh, all are active high. Two inputs. I0 is the least significant, I1 is the le most significant. Well, how do you know that? Is it a general form? Absolutely. So whenever you see inputs or outputs with a number associated with it, either in the subscript form or the name followed by a number, that numbering scheme actually tells you the uh, significance. So I0, I1 and so on, and in this case, y0, y1, y2, y3. So the numbering 0, 1, 2, 3 is actually telling you the significance. So in this case, i1 would be the most significant input and most significant input and i0 will be the least significant input. Uh, does that apply for letters as well? Uh, letters followed by the numbers. Right, so it it follow it, it applies for letters followed by the numbers, but if you are saying that if you had A and B or A B C D, then it doesn't follow. So you cannot generalize that for uh, say A B C D as four inputs. You can only generalize that for letters that are followed by numbers because numbers you can use that as uh, indicators of significance. So I hope I ha answered that question. Let me next turn to uh, trying to make sure that this actually is in agreement with the expressions that we saw. So what I'll do is I'll simply try to track down what would be the logic expression for Y0. So as you can see, Y0 has three particular inputs going to an AND gate. 
the inputs are i0 complement let me just highlight that maybe in in blue here so i0 complement is going in there and then i1 complement is going in there and then of course every and gate will have an enable input from right there right so this guy is enable and i0 complement and i1 complement which is simply enable and min term 0 right so that is exactly what we had when we were when we were writing these guys out right for the say for the case of all everything being active high that's exactly what we had for y0 and if you track this down to y1 y2 y3 you will see that your truth table is in agreement with your logic expressions is in agreement with your logic diagram so where does all of this go well all of this goes inside this particular box right so that's how your inputs and outputs are related so all that logic diagram is essentially what goes inside this two to four decoder box all right so that was everything being active high but we also saw that we can make things active low so let's try to take a look at this particular diagram in this case we have an active low enable signal so this is your active low enable i hope you guys are going to uh, you know catch on this uh, sort of notation that i'm following of active high and active low al for active low ah for active high uh, so active low enable here indicated by that underscore l and now, as Kang pointed out, does that apply to letters or not, right? Because for over here, I have one A and one B. I don't have I0 and I1. I could have known the significance then. I don't know that. I just have A and B. So let me actually use the logic diagram in this case to tell me which input is actually least significant input and which one is the most significant input i have four active low outputs right so let me box them up over here and call them four active low outputs active low outputs again this will be in agreement with the active low outputs uh, the expressions we wrote for active low outputs Let's try to see uh, which one is least significant here. So uh, the way you can do that is uh, simply by tracking down the connections to y0 underscore l. So the connections to y0 underscore l uh, are from here. Uh, maybe I want that to be straight line. Oh, okay. You already are a straight line. Okay. So that's one connection. And the other connection to y0 underscore l through that NAND gate is through here. These two pink lines tell me that y0 underscore l will be dependent on a complement and b complement. Okay, so that doesn't help me that much maybe i move to the next one uh, y1 underscore l y1 underscore l still depends on b complement but now it depends on uh, a so a changed but b didn't change so which one changed faster as we went down this list a changed faster right a changed first so a should be least significant you guys see how to, to do this? A is least significant input and B is most significant input. Now you guys might be wondering why do we have a one as a prefix to every name? That one actually corresponds to the first two to four decoder in that 74x139 chip. 
because I told you that this is just the half of it, right? So there are two of them. So for the second one, the naming will be two followed by G underscore L, A, B, and so on. So that was for the second chip. Uh, let me also try to uh, figure out uh, certain things here. So I'll, I'll do an example. Uh, what about inputs? Inputs are active high, active low? What do you guys say? Active high, right. So active high inputs. So let me um, go through an example here. What I'll do is I will uh, pick I'll try to make G underscore L zero. I'll connect it to ground. And then I will have uh, one A as one and one B as zero. Those are my inputs and I've come up with some arbitrary assignment for my inputs. So can you guys tell me what are the four outputs going to be in this case? Y zero, Y one, Y two, Y three in that particular order or in the reverse order? This, 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 this. So why, why zero underscore L? It's an active low output. For this particular input sequence of one and zero for A and B, is Y zero active or not? It's going to be inactive, right? So if it is inactive, it will have a value of one. You guys see that? If it is inactive, the value is one because that's not active. Which one is going to be active? Well, your input is zero and one. A is least significant, B is most significant. So you can literally try to look at it as zero one. Zero one in binary, when you convert that to decimal, you get a one in decimal. That indicates that Y one underscore L should be active and everything else should be inactive. You guys see that? So that is inactive, this should be active, that should be inactive, that should be inactive. One of the attractive features of a decoder is the fact that only one output is active at any given time. We actually use that particular feature to uh, do several other interesting applications. So only one output can be active. And who takes the responsibility of that? The, the designer, right? So the, the person who designs the chip actually takes the responsibility of that. All right, so let, let's talk about these two points here at the bottom, input buffering and NAND gates, right? So NAND gates are universal gates, fewer transistors, which leads to a smaller uh, uh, gate delay, hence, faster. That's why we are using NAND gates as opposed to AND gates, right? So in other words, if you try to look at the difference between this slide and the slide before that, the only difference is we have added on four bubbles at the output and then we have called the outputs Y underscore L, Y zero, all of them active low. That's it. That's how we got to this. So we have actually transitioned the AND gates to NAND gates and now because of that our outputs have become active low. Everything else remained the same. However, there is also a slight change here on the input side. Let me, let me see if you guys catch that. The enable was going straight through to four things, right? Enable was going to four things. So that if the voltage level on this a particular line, enable line, uh, is kind of uh, near a week zero or a week one, we would be in trouble. So what we do is we are going to use this particular NOT gate to make sure that our voltage levels are 
reinforced by that NOT gate. And then you can now put it to all the four uh, 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 NAND gate inputs. Double negation in the active low diagram. Double negation in the act. Yes, that's exactly right. So this bubble and that underscore L are effectively cancelling out to be the same as no bubble and the active high output. All right, so we talked about the enable going into a um, active low enable and that actually helping us with the buffering and maintaining those voltage levels. And we do the same thing even for the two NOT gates over here. For example, if you look at I0, the true form of I0 and the true form of I1, that is straight going to two of the gates. And for even for I1, it is going to two of the gates. But what if the voltage levels are close to the undefined region? We would be in trouble. So what we can do is we can put two NOT gates and then use the output of the second NOT gate as the true out, true I0 or true I1. That is exactly what we are doing here. Two NOT gates and that will uh, help us do the buffering which means that you know it will uh, reinforce the voltage levels so that uh, we don't end up into a uh, voltage confusion within the chip. So I hope uh, you guys are uh, okay with those two points. Uh, I, I really hope that you uh, understand the reasoning behind using the double negated version and going into the chip as opposed to going straight from here, right? So does the buffering add some delay? Yes, it does. It adds a little bit of delay, but what it saves us is a bigger achievement, right? Like it, it saves us from that uh, 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 voltage being in the uh, close to the undefined region because these could be coming from a previous module, right? So those, um, those voltage levels might not be a solid zero or solid one. So the benefit outweigh the consequences. Absolutely right. All right, let's move on here. I think we talked about enough. All right, so that's your half of that 74X139 symbol. So this is just the half of it. Uh, in fact, it, for completeness, I can indicate that it is half because these numbers are prefixed with 111111 all over, right? So you have an active low enable, you have two active high inputs a is least significant b is most significant input and then you have four active low outputs that is half of that chip now i also want to point out the notation here you see your enable is active low and that that bubble actually cancels out that active low uh, input of for enable so inside the chip, you are, we are calling that G. Outside the chip, we are calling that G underscore L and there is a bubble at the front. What that also means is I, I should not be writing something like this, right? That, that would be a, an active high enable in that case. So I'll show you guys on, on a later slide uh, how not to write the symbols. So this would be a decoder symbol for half of that chip. Let me also try to do this. Uh, while we are here, I will say uh, this is high, this is a, a zero, and this is a one. What are the outputs? all ones, everything inactive. Inactive, 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 inactive. Reason for that, disabled decoder. Now, 
as I said, that was half of the chip. So what is the complete chip? Well, the complete chip has two of them. The first one and the second one. So this would be a, a 16 pin IC where you have two 2 to 4 decoders in it. Let me highlight those decoders as boxes. So the first one, a copy of the say the, the thing that we talked about. Come on. Snap. Okay. So that's right here. And then the second one, which is not connected to the first one directly, is right there. So you have two of them in that one chip. Uh, the output would be written as Y3, Y2, Y1, Y0. That's absolutely right because Y3 is your most significant output. You guys see that? So you have two, two to four decoders, active low enables, active high inputs, active low outputs in that. So that's your complete 74X139 chip. What is not shown here is the fact that in order for you to get this decoder to work, you still need to connect the ground and the VCC connections to the, the whole chip. So if you look at the data sheet for a 74X139, you will find those details about which pin is ground and which pin is uh, VCC. So provided you do the power, pin 8 is ground and 16 is VCC. There you go. So once you connect those, then you can use all your enables and inputs and outputs and all that. Now, where is this coming from? Well, this is just a copy of what we saw earlier, right? Now there are just two copies of them. One is the first one, the other is the second one. But they're inside that same chip. So I was talking about how not to show the symbols, right? So this one is okay because active low enable, active low outputs, inputs are active high, things are fine. But if you if you look at this symbol here on the right, you have indicated that inside the chip you are referring to the enable as active low, but you also have a bubble up front which are effectively going to cancel out giving you a active high enable which is not what 74x139 chip does so you, you can't have that twice you can only have that once either here or as bubbles at the output or an input now let's talk about making the size of the decoder a little bit bigger. So all we did was went from a two to four decoder to a three to eight decoder. We need to talk about three different things here. Enables, inputs, outputs. So let me start with enables. How many enables do you see here? Three. Uh, come on. All right, so we have got three enables. I hope you guys are questioning, all right, why do we need three enables for one uh, three to eight decoder? And, you know, keep that question uh, with you guys. I will be answering that with, uh, in, in a little bit, with the right use of those three enables. They are particularly uh, uh, important when you start cascading decoders. All right, so three enables. Uh, are all of them active high? Are all of them active low? What is going on? So it looks like one of them is active high. G1 is active high. And two of them are active low. 
G2A underscore L and G2B underscore L. So those are two active low enables. One of them is active high with G1. That's as far as enables are concerned and their active level. Next, let's move our focus on inputs. We have got three inputs. Well, that's consistent with three. I need, I need three and eight outputs. All my inputs are active high, active high inputs. I next need to worry about which one is the most significant input and which one is the least significant input. And I will do that by, you know, I, I could straight away go and say A is least significant, uh, but I don't want to jump the gun. I want to show you guys how do you get that information from the logic diagram that is presented from in front of you. You have a very similar construction to this bunch of not gates over here to compute the true and complement forms of the inputs exactly the same way as we did earlier bunch of not gates to compute true and complemented forms buffered true and complemented forms of the inputs same followed by what we had four nand gates here we had four nand gates here we had four of them because it was a two to four decoder. But now we have a three to eight decoder. So we have eight NAND gates giving you an output of eight active low outputs. Uh, looks like A and A complement are alternating. So it has to be least significant. You got it right. You see, so Bennett is able to say that pretty quickly by observing the A and A complement. So A goes here, right? Uh, this is too big. So A goes to this chip and this chip and this chip and this chip alternates. And then A complement was going to that guy, to that guy, to that guy, and one more to this guy. You see, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, alternating the fastest, hence least significant. But And if you observed B and say the, mo the the extreme case C, you will find that it will be in the form of zero, 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 a bunch of zeros followed by a bunch of ones and that's it, right? Repeats the slowest. And you can, uh, you can validate that by looking at where is C going to? This guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, all at once. Where is C complement going to? One, two, three, four, all at once. So things that are changing the slowest will be your most significant. 51, 52, 53, least significant repeats changes the fastest. Five is remaining the same, most significant. All right, so I hope that was helpful. We, we talked about the significance now. So A is your least significant input and C is your most significant input. Next, um, all your outputs are active low. So let me box them up here and call this eight active low outputs. So let's try to come up with an example to talk about this. Uh, suppose you have a one zero zero. So you have a, a one there, a zero there, a zero there. And as you can see, you can actually track this, right? That one becomes a zero here that zero goes here, that zero goes here, they get complemented, one, 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 and out comes a one, right? So that's how you know it would be an enabled situation. So I've given you guys uh, G1, G2A underscore L, G2B underscore L as one, zero, zero respectively. Um, and let us say our inputs are one, one, zero. So one here, one here, zero here. Uh, what, which output is active in this case? Y3 underscore L is active. Beautiful. So Y3 underscore L active because C, B, A most significant down to least significant zero one one in binary 
that would correspond to three in decimal. So this guy should be active, which means I should say this guy equals one. Uh, sorry, that guy e active zero, everything else should be a one. You guys see that? The only gate that will be active is this guy. Everything else will have at least one input being uh, high. Which makes the output high. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, at least one input being low, which makes the output high because it's a NAND gate. Uh, what else do we need to talk about? All right, questions here. We still need to talk about the usage of three enables. We will do that in just a bit. Uh, but I'm hoping that with this discussion, you guys are able to uh, see uh, how do you identify the significance of the inputs? How do you identify the active levels for enables, inputs, outputs? Um, and then for a given sequence of inputs, whether it be enable or whether it be inputs, are you able to comment about the outputs? Uh, just to uh, do a little bit more discussion here, uh, as you can see, 110 at the inputs go to 0, 0, 1 here, and then that will make this guy 1, this guy 1, this guy 0. And now, if you take a look at this particular uh, NAND gate, all its inputs, what are they? This guy is, well, where is the enable? The enable should be coming from somewhere. Uh, enable is coming through here. So that's a 1 enable. Uh, the next one is one, the next one is a one, and the next one is one. Every input to that NAND gate is a one, which will make that output a zero. And the only NAND gate which will have this situation is this one for this particular in input sequence. Uh, can the output be written in this zero x f7, 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 f and seven. Uh, yes, you can write the output in that sequence. Uh, so, uh, but then the, the, there has to be a, 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 a need for that, right? For example, uh, if I ask you guys to uh, do this on an exam, I may say, all right, represent the output in the hexadecimal format. In that case, you absolutely can do that. And F7 is correct. F then seven. All right, uh, let's see. I think that, that that's it. So the symbol for this 74X138 chip, which is for the 328 decoder is this. I've got three enables, one of them active high, two of them active low three active high inputs with A being least significant and C being most significant, and then eight active low outputs, Y0 all the way to Y7. Um, what do you guys think this is? Six, four, five, one, two, what are those? Uh, no, 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 pin numbers, right? pin numbers of that chip. So again, you have uh, eight for ground, 16 for VCC. Those are not shown explicitly, but everything else is shown. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, I think this is it. And there is only one three to eight decoder in this. All right, we'll do another example. Let's say we have one, zero, one, uh, one, zero, one. What are the outputs? I've just given up, given you an arbitrary input sequence for enables, 
and inputs all once. All right, Brandon is quick to figure out uh, the disabled configuration. Uh, so I'm going to slightly change this to this and talk about uh, 0, 1, 1. All right, what about now? Which pin, which pin is low? Which output pin is low? Which output pin is low? Brandon says six. Uh, uh, pin pin number. Pin number nine, right? So pin number nine would be low. Everything else would be high. High, 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 low, high. Because it is one, one, zero. That corresponds to six. Six is Y six. That pin number is nine. So answer would be nine in this case. You guys see that? So we are, we are talking about the pin number. <laughs> Right, so I did blue for the other case and then red color coordinated with the second example. All right, uh, let's move on. Now, a very interesting application of decoder cascading. Can I use multiple 74X138 chips to actually make a bigger 4 to 16 decoder? And the answer is yes, absolutely you can. And you can actually use the multiple inputs, multiple enable inputs as the thing that will help you in cascading these decoders. So right off the bat, try to look at things from a very high level. You have got two 74X138 chips. Enables inputs active low outputs enables inputs active low outputs i wanted to make a 4 to 16 decoder so i should have four inputs and 16 outputs where are my four inputs well they are n3 n2 n1 n0 those are my four inputs where are my where are the 16 outputs well they are all here eight of them coming from the top chip and then eight of them coming from the bottom chip next let us take a look at how the enables have been connected the enable for g1 has been hardwired to 5 volts so that is enabled it's fixed. It's done. And the same thing has been done for the active low enable for the bottom chip. G2B is hardwired to ground. So that's enabled. Done. So what we are left with is the two active low enables for the top chip and then G1 and G2A, uh, uh, the active low enable for the bottom chip. For the entire 4 to 16 decoder, you have one enable, which is the enable underscore L. So this could either be a zero or this could be a one, right? So let's talk about this guy now, because this is, uh, this is where everything is happening. So this could either be a zero or I will use blue to indicate one. So when enable underscore L is zero, which chip is enabled, the top one or the bottom one? Both. So as far as enable is concerned, both are good to go, both. Next, let us take a look at what is connected to your other enable input. Uh, sorry, zero or one, right? So if it is zero, it is enabled. If it is one, it is disabled, but that controls both of them. 
uh, let me see this one enables both this one disables both next let us take a look at n3 n3 is controlling the active low enable of the top chip and N3 is controlling the active high enable of the bottom chip. So let's talk about that next. When N3 is zero, what would happen? The top chip would be enabled. Can I say that? And then when N3 is one, the bottom chip is enabled. So when N3 is zero, you get outputs for the first eight cases. And when N3 is one, you get your outputs for the last eight cases. Let us try to uh, bring in a little bit more uh, what is that? So, so there's a ch question in the chat box. So U2 is the most significant chip. U2 is the most significant chip. Yes, you're right. So there are two, three to, uh, three to eight decoders here. U2 is for, you see this, uh, the, the way you identify them is, look at the numbering scheme for the outputs. 15, 14, all the way down to zero, right? So these are more significant. Uh, let us also try to do something different here to build some more understanding. What I'll do is I will add a page here and I will use a table. So I've got four inputs and I've got 16 outputs. Uh, I'm going to assume that things are enabled. Then I'm just going to talk about N3, N2, N1, N0, right? So those are my four inputs. My outputs are y15 underscore l, y14 underscore l, all the way down to y3, well, let's do y2 underscore l, y1 underscore l, y0 underscore l, right? So there are 16 outputs. My inputs, how do they go, uh, go on? Well, all four zeros, this will repeat, uh, and then, until seven. And then after that, you have a jump to eight. All the way to one, 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 right? And the way this should be decoded is only one output can be active at any given time. So for the first row, we are going to get this guy to be enabled. Everything else gets disabled. And then for the next one, that zero is going to travel diagonally to the left, down, right? So it's going to go zero here, then zero here, and so on. And then somewhere over here, it'll stop at seven. After that, it's going to move to eight, nine, blah, 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 all the way down to 15, right? So it's moving everything else that is shaded, uh, sorry, everything else, oh my gosh, why is this one? This has to be zero. Everything else that is missing here and here, all of that are a bunch of ones, right? I'm not writing that. But as you can see, this guy is going to move diagonally all the way to the left. Only one active at any given time. So the top chip is the first eight outputs. And for that, you have N3 is zero. And for the next eight outputs being active, you have N3 being a one, right? So that's how 
we are doing things over here by using n3. Now how about n2, n1 and n0, the least significant 3 bits for the for the 4 input. Well, that is going to be the same, right? So if you look at these three columns here, they are just going to repeat, right? It's the same. 0, 0, 0 all the way to 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0 all the way to 1, 1, 1. So they are going to be the remaining the same for both the U1 and U2 chips. And that's ex exactly what we have here. N0, A, A. N1, B, B. N2, C, C. So using enables, multiple enables, to cascade decoders to build bigger size decoders. You guys see that? Questions about this? Uh, what is the limit? Well, uh, uh, what, whatever your application is, because this is not a, this is not, um, it, it, there is no fan in fan out limitations that I have to worry about, right? Because I can use the enables that come from another box to, to, to keep incrementing it, right? So for example, if I have three enables over here, and if I have three enables over here, I can put them through another combinational circuit to determine which one becomes active for a particular input situation. And then I can selectively enable uh, several other uh, 743138 uh, chips. So I don't think that there is any uh, limit, hard limit in terms of uh, fan in fan out directly. Uh, because you can you can do multiple with this. All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, by the way, now if you think about this, a decoder ensures that I have only one output active at any given time, right? So I could actually use a decoder as a combinational circuit that controls enable lines for the second stage of decoders, right? So I could, I could do a lot of interesting things with that. All right, uh, one such idea is uh, something that you're exploring in the homework. All right, let's move on to this one. So this is a slightly different decoder in that it is going to take a BCD code, binary coded decimal provided by four inputs and convert it into a seven segment output. So there are seven segments. These are all active high outputs, right? So these are all active high outputs. And given that you guys have done your uh, studio, uh, studio two, you guys know that these symbols are, 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 you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G correspond to segments on a seven segment display as A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Uh, this particular chip has all of the outputs as active high. So if you have it as one, that means that particular LED is uh, on. Your inputs are also active high. And there is a enable, but there's a slightly different enable here. This is called a blanking input enable, uh, sorry, blanking input uh, pin. Blanking input. So if it's actually uh, active, that means that you are going to blank out on the output, right? So if you, if you actually connect this to a zero, that means all of these guys are going to be low. They are not going to be, uh, uh, enabled, right? So it's so it's slightly different from the enable. It's kind of the opposite of enable. It's a blanking input. Uh, in terms of A, B, C, and D, uh, what is the most significant? What is the least significant? Again, we have A as our least significant input and D as our most significant uh, input. So if you had your input as 0, 1, 0, 0, 
uh, what would appear? Why isn't it B1, BR? Oh, over here it would be, right? So outside it would be called BI underscore L, but I cannot call, it, call them twice over here. So something like this, if I go back here, you see, uh, inside the chip, it's called G2A. Outside, it's called G2A underscore L. So it's the same same reasoning. It's an active low um, blanking input. Active low. So when it is actually low, you blank. Right, so all the inputs are off in that case. So if you don't want them to be blank, then you actually do uh, one over there. Uh, A, F, B, G, C. Oh, that's for the four, right? So I hope you guys uh, said, if my inputs are zero, one, zero, zero, it would be four provided I actually uh, have this at one or uh, high imp open. If you leave this pin open, or if you connect it to a one, only then zero one zero zero would translate into a four being displayed, right? That's that's, that's your BCD to seven segment decoder, right? Uh, so in this case, what are the segments? A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. So I've got B, C, F, and G as active. Everything else is inactive. B, C, F, and G. Yes, everything else is inactive. So that would be four being displayed. So in that way, you can also say uh, A is off, B is on, C is on, D is off, E is off, F is on, and G is on. But for that to happen, you need to have this uh, at one or open. You can find uh, uh, more details about this. If you're curious, you can find more details about this. Just uh, Google 7.4, say LS49 data sheet, uh, and you will find uh, all the details about this. Okay. Let's move on to some other applications of decoders. And this is uh, particularly interesting to me. Before that, I want to lay out some motivation, which is, let's try to ask this question. How to synthesize logic functions? So let's try to write a, an exhaustive list here. How many different ways have you guys learned to synthesize logic functions? I will start you guys off basic gates and or and not if I use these basic gates I can synthesize a logic function any logic function I can synthesize using these basic gates so let us try to slowly add to this list what is the second one oh no so uh, not uh, we are not asking about implementation just about synthesis so it, it is still in the a higher level stage. Universal gates, NAND gates, right? So that's second one. I can use NAND gates to synthesize any logic function. This has to be applicable for any logic function. So NAND only, NOR only, good. What's next? Mm, Boolean algebra expressions uh, so Boolean algebra expressions, well, those would be expressions, right? So once you write those expressions, then you will start, you will have to try to look for uh, some basic gates or maybe NAND or maybe NOR, uh, but, but that is it, like blocks and signals, uh, blocks and signals and or and or circuit okay so 
that is good and our circuit is what uh, SOP I can synthesize any logic function in its SOP form or canonical SOP form so I can use the and or circuit to do this POS of course so we can add POS and canonical POS to this list any logic function can be done uh, what exactly is synthesis so synthesis is the step before you try to implement right so when you try to implement a logic function then it comes down to transistors right so you are going to put up transistors in a particular configuration and you would implement your design but before you go to transistors you have a level of logic function uh, you know it's a it's a very elementary stage right that's where your design is in the I'm going to be sketching logic diagrams I'm going to be sketching uh, you know the NAND only synthesis so adding bubbles and timing diagrams don't fall in the under the synthesis category so this is a relationship so synthesis you can you can you can you can look at synthesis as uh, relationship between outputs and inputs on a logic symbol level right because after you are sure about your logic symbol level uh, then you can start th saying all right I'm now going to start putting transistors in there which will actually go to how things are going to look like when you actually make it into a hardware form so that's your implementation so synthesis comes before that so in your SOP POS all these forms this is your and or circuit this is your R and circuit um, what's next what's next in this list we have learned one more we have learned programmable logic array right which is also like a extension of and dot circuit but this was programmable uh, next what we are going to add to this list today is decoders so we are going to be focusing on point number seven next and later on we are also going to see that you can use multiplexers to synthesize any logic function which is probably my uh, most uh, fun topics to discuss mux yes how do you synthesize any logic function using a mux how do you synthesize any logic function using a decoder that's exactly what we are trying to figure out next we are here we have done one through six before now let me build some more understanding on this by looking at where we started you see when we looked at building a two to four decoder and when we wanted active low outputs we actually got outputs that are related directly to max terms right so if the outputs of a decoder are related to max terms I can selectively put certain max terms through a, a OR gate to implement a sum of max term form you guys see that that will give me any logic function right because that would be the canonical product of some form of a logic function that's that's what we are doing next uh, many where is it it's right here let's talk about that with this we are going to use this 74x138 chip to synthesize this particular logic function f is a and b or a, a b c or a B complement C complement or A complement B and C complement so uh, can you guys tell me this in the canonical SOP SOP form like uh, the shorthand how many days we in black 
let's say my input order is A, B, C. What should I write here? Two four seven. Uh, why seven? So A B C. That's one one one. A B C one zero zero. A B C zero one zero. Right. So that would be min term seven. Min term four. Min term two. Right. Right. So the the same function. Earlier, it was represented in canonical sum of product complete function. And now we have translated that into a canonical sum of product shorthand. The one thing that we did as an assumption right now is that we have considered A as our most significant input. Next, I can also express f complement as let's try to represent f complement in shorthand canonical product of sum pi again we'll do a b c what should i fill here Instead of f, I'm looking at f complement. Instead of looking at canonical sum of product, I'm looking at canonical product of sum. So f, f complement, SOP, POS, what should be the numbers? No. Same, yes. All right, so first of all, there are just three terms, right? One, two, and three. So this would be one, 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 seven, one, zero, zero, four, one zero uh, sorry zero one zero two right right so it's it's f complement as well as pos so both of the uh, relationships are getting complementary so this would be again the same one two four seven so i've got two options here right <laughs> You guys are not going to leave it alone for a little bit, huh? All right. So we have got two options here. One is take the min terms and put them through a AND gate. All right. So, so to implement F, we are trying to implement F, right? So take min terms. And, and, AND them. You guys see that? So that's one approach. You can take min term 2, min term 4, min term 7 and put them through an AND gate and you're done. Do you have min terms here? What do you have available here? These are active low outputs. So all of these are max terms. Absolutely. Can I convert it into min terms? What would it, what would what would it need to convert into min terms? An inverter, a not function, a bubble maybe. If I put another bubble there, after the bubble, I've got min terms. Which min terms do I need? Two, four, and seven. This and this and this, because it's the SOP form, right? So I can, one, one option to synthesize is use a AND gate and put these things into it. 
uh, in blue yes where is 2 uh, 2 is right there where is 4 4 is right there where is 7 7 is right there and out comes your F let's turn our attention to the uh, enables for this to actually work should I have my chip enabled or disabled enabled all right so let's work on enabling this chip I'm going to connect G1 to plus 5 volts using some arbitrary pull-up resistor and then I'm going to hardwire G2A and G2B to ground. Can I consider my decoder enabled? Perfect. Next, how about the inputs? Now this is a tricky question. What about the inputs? Inside the chip, you know that A is, oh boy, A is least significant, C is most significant, right, inside the chip. But how did we choose ABC in our function? When we were writing out this function, we chose A, the other direction, right? So if you really want to use the numbers min term 2, 4, and 7, then you have to stay consistent with this scheme which means I would connect the input A to my logic function here, B is the same place, C would be over here. You guys see that? So inputs are connected in the opposite way just because of this scheme, 2, 4, 7. Next, uh, let's see. That's one way of doing it, right? Now let's try to focus on what this is. Can you guys tell me what this is using De Morgan's law? A NOR, right? So this would be one approach is to convert them into min terms by applying a NOT and then AND them together. That would give you the function or you can simply take the max term, so I'm just going to, and you guys said it, right? That would be, that would essentially be a, a, a NOR function. I have max terms here. I'm going to do a product of the max terms. I need what? Max term 2, 4, and 7. Okay, so I've got max term uh, 2 from here, 4 from here, 7 from here. And I put them through an AND gate, not, not AND gate, oh, right, AND gate. Earlier, I, I, have, I would have had to do a OR gate earlier. Now I need AND gate. This, AND, this, AND, this. I've got what? F complement. I'm simply synthesizing this particular function. F complement is the product of sum of A, B, and C. Max terms are 2, 4, and 7. I tapped the max terms from 2, 4, and 7. Did the AND because I needed and of these three because it's a product of sum. Earlier I used AND gate earlier. That was wrong. That was supposed to be OR. I, I miswrote that as AND earlier. When we were doing the take the min terms. This should be OR them together. Or the second approach is take max terms and AND them. 
Yes. So this gives me F complement. I needed F. So what can I do? I can simply remove this and add a bubble. Done. So take the max terms, put them through a NAND gate, you get the function F. Now let's try to backtrack, right? What would this be equal to? Let me copy the slide next. Uh, what if I do? Oh, there it is. You see this? I'm going to try to do this in the other version next. Copy. Oh my gosh. We can try to uh, apply De Morgan's law to convert that NAND gate into something else. Uh, can I do this? A bubble there, bubble there, bubble there, and R. Will that work? I've just reverted that, right? So now if you look, max term here became min term there, and then you have the R, right? So the sum of min terms give you F for the same ones, 2, 4, and 7. And the, in the previous version, you had product of max terms. Right? So you can either do product of max terms or you can do sum of min terms. Both actually lead to the same uh, result. One is just represented with NAND and the other version is represented with uh, R with inverted inputs. You guys see that? So this is uh, implementing things this way. And so SOP form, right? And in the previous one, we were doing it using the uh, product of some form. So, uh, do, Andrew, do you mean uh, you're asking how it works or the way it works is cool? I agree. So all I had to do was enable the decoder, connect the inputs to my arbitrary logic function in a specific order. I had to pay attention to whether the, the which one was the most significant, which one was the least significant. I had to pay attention to that. Then I looked at two different variations of synthesizing any logic function. The first one, we used the canonical sum of product, the other was canonical product of sum. So either take the min terms and then R them, the chip itself was giving us max terms. So you can, uh, uh, you can flip them and then go through an R gate, which is this version right here, or the other version is straight to take the max terms. In this case, we only need two, four, seven as the max terms. Two, four, and seven. Go through an AND gate to get F complement. But if you want your output to be, uh, you, there is F complement is not what you want. You want F. So you can just use a NAND gate instead of AND gate. Now, let us ask a very important question. Is the output F active high or active low? Active high, yes, absolutely right. <laughs> In other words, if you actually made a truth table for this particular 74X138 chip and with having A, B, C as your inputs and F as your output, F would be one 
when ABC are 1, ABC are 1, 0, 0, ABC are 0, 1, 1, you would get a 1 in the truth table, indicating that F, it, F is actually active high output. Okay. What if I wanted active low output? What would I need to do? Yep. And gate instead of NAND gate and you're done. Uh, the input switching. Yes. So you see this uh, ABC are three inputs, right? There are certain inputs to the decoder chip but I could connect them to whatever inputs I have to my function. So I could have connected them as A, B, C or C, B, A, whatever sequence I want. But because I started observing the logic function, assuming that A is most significant and C is least significant, that is why I chose the numbers two, four, seven, right? Because you see what happens, if you actually chose something else, so suppose you, you did this, right? So suppose you did over here on the next slide, I will say F equals summation CBA. Suppose you did this CBA. What would, what would, what would be the numbers now? One, uh, one, two, seven, uh, two is right. So you would have one one one, so that's seven. Zero zero one, so that would be one, right? Right. And then you would have zero one zero. So that would be two. One two seven, yes. Right. So you would not take y two, y four, y seven. You would actually change that to y one, y two, y seven. But you would also have to change this back to CBA, right? Because you did CBA there. Nice, perfect. All right, so let me erase this because it may be causing some confusion later on. All right, uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. All right, other questions about this? How do you implement uh, logic functions using uh, 3 to 8 decoder. Actually, you, you see, if I go back here and take a look at this, we already know how to make a 4 to 16 decoder, right? So we could potentially use this design to synthesize any logic function which has four inputs. All we would need to do is take specific outputs, these are all max terms, take specific outputs and go to a NAND gate to get an active high output or AND gate to get an active low output. That's it. And you would have figured out how do you synthesize a logic function with four inputs. But for that you would need a 4 to 16 decoder. All right, uh, let's see. No, 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 no. Okay, I think this is good. This is done. Now we flip the story to encoders. Uh, so, sorry, could you get a 5 to 32 decoder using four chips? That's your homework problem, Bennett. <laughs> I, I think that's your homework problem. or It's, it's very similar to that. Yes, you, you could uh, get it with four chips. Is each chip a 3 to 8 or a 2 to 4? Three, eight, 3 to 8. Yes, you can actually get it done with uh, 3 to 8 chips. Uh, 4 chips, yes, with, with 3 to 8. But you would need some combinational logic before the... Uh, apart from the... 3 to 8 decoders, you would also need some additional uh, combinational logic to essentially control when when these guys switch on and off, right? So something similar to this. You will need a, a combinational logic to do this. But 
but that's that's your homework problem. All right, so here, uh, encoders versus decoders. All right, so we looked at decoders. What should encoders do? We have got uh, 25 minutes. Let us uh, lay out the basics of encoders. Uh, should encode, right? Decoders were decoding, we should encode. All right, so let's try to point out certain differences between decoder and encoder. First of all, number of inputs and outputs. For a decoder, n inputs corresponded to two raised to n outputs. For an encoder, story is reverse. Two raised to n inputs, n outputs. Exactly the opposite. Encoders actually come in two general types. One is basic encoder, which has certain problems. Those problems are overcome by the priority encoder priority encoder. We'll be looking at both. For decoders, we said only one output can be active at any given time, right? So only one output, only one output. Can be active. An input and two log two and huh? log base two. Right, right, right. Log base two outputs. So, so if you, suppose you had three to eight decoder, now you will have eight to three encoder, thirty-two to five, uh, thirty-two to five encoder, sixteen to four, and so on. So yeah, that's that's related by log. Yes, base two. Uh, only one output can be at any given time. And who takes care of that? Who guarantees that? The designer worries about only one out output being active. It's not on the user. The user just gives enables and inputs. The user doesn't take the guarantee that only one output is going to be active. However, the story is slightly different when it comes to encoder. For encoder, if over here only one output had to be act active, over here only one input should be active, right? Only one input can be active. Who takes the responsibility of that? All right, somebody's microphone is on, I think. I'm getting a very small amount of echo. Um, so who takes care, who takes the responsibility of that? We do, yes, the user does. Because it's an input, right? So how are you going to control that the input is following a rule? Well, you can't. So the user has to take the responsibility of which input, whether you are making sure that only one output is, one input is active. The user has to worry about that. But users are human, which means there is a possibility that more than one input could be active. What do we do then? We establish priority. That's the reason why we need a priority encoder as opposed to a basic encoder. So for a basic encoder, we assume that everything is ideal. The user is making sure 100% that only one input is active. But a priority encoder gives you a little bit of room by making one input more preferable than the other input. We'll talk about all those variations. Let's talk about the basic encoder the same way as we did with the 2 to 4 decoder. We'll start off with 4 to 2 basic encoder. 4 to 2, we'll start off with the basic one, basic encoder. Another table, all combinational logic has to have truth tables. That's what identifies them, differentiates them. I've got four inputs, 
I'll call oh, come on. I zero, I one, I two, I three. I am assuming that everything is enabled, and I am assuming that all inputs and outputs are active. Hi, for the first two table for the four to two basic encoder. My outputs are two of them. Y one, Y zero. And right away, based on my numbering scheme for the subscript, you know the least significant input and the least significant outputs. The significance order, you know that. For the basic encoder, the user has to guarantee that only one out one input is active. Which means the user has to make sure that I zero is active or i1 is active or i2 is active or i3 is active only one can be active which means everything else has to be inactive has to be inactive has to be inactive has to be inactive and how do you encode that well if i0 is active you encode that as 00, zero. If I1 is active, you encode that as 0, 01. I2 is active, encode that as 2. I3 is active, encode that as 3, 1, 1. This guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. 0, 1, 2, and 3. 0, 0, 0. 0, 1, 1, 2, 3. That's your standard 4 to 2 basic encoder. And I'm assuming that it is enabled here and everything is active high. Now what I want to do with this is, I want you guys to tell me the expressions, logic expressions for the two outputs, y0 and y1. What is the logic expression for y0? And what is the logic expression for y1? We can do this. All right, Andrew says y0 is i1 or i3. Perfect. So y0 is active when i1 is active or when i3 is active. So that's your first equation. Y0 is I1 or I3. What about Y1? What is the logic expression for Y1? I2 or I3? After looking at these two logic expressions, is something bothering you guys? Only one can be active, right? Yeah, that's right. Only that, so that is the basic encoder. But when you look at these two expressions, is something missing? We don't need I0, yes. So I0 is actually not connected to anything. You don't even need it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what I0 is. What matters is I1, I2 or I3. Because those are the only places does it just chill there. It, it's The user connects it or doesn't connect it, doesn't matter. It just chills there, yes. I, I'll show you guys diagrams. It, it's not connected to anything internally, internal to the chip. It's like the output enable. Uh, so it can be used for that purpose. It can be used for detecting whether one of the inputs is, uh, at, at least one of the inputs is uh, active or not. It can be used for that. But internal to the chip for basic encoder, you, it is not connected to anything. All right, so those are your uh, logic expressions. What we'll do next is uh, we will try to look at the so this is just OR gate, right? You see this? This is I1 or I3. Over here, 
this is I2 or I3. Now, what if you were doing a 8 to 3 basic encoder? If you were doing a 8 to 3 basic encoder, what do you think these uh, inputs would be? For Y0 and y, uh, Y1, what would be the expressions? And in that case, you will also have Y2. Can I say that if this were a 8 to 3 basic encoder, my Y0 would have been I1 or I3 or I5 or I7, right? 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. And then for Y1, I would do I2, I3, no I4, no I5, plus I6, plus I7. That would be my Y1. And then for Y3, I would get four zeros followed by four ones. Uh, I4 doesn't matter. Well, it will matter for y th Y2, right? Because you will get four zeros and then four ones, right? So that will be for Y, because that is eight to three, right? So three outputs, Y2 would be there. So this will alternate I5, I7. This will go two ones, two zeros, two ones, and then it will go four zeros, four ones. Now, if you go and look at the same thing here, this is your binary encoder. This is your two raise to n inputs and outputs. You are assuming that you have three outputs and eight inputs. You can see this, the equations for y0, y1, and y2. i1, i3, i5, i7, based on the same truth table, just bigger. y1 i2, i3, i6, i7, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. For y2, you got four zeros, then four ones. Uh, forgot about poor y3. Uh, y3, well, y0, y1, y2, right? So there are three of them, three, three outputs. Right, i2, y2. Uh, and you see this, i0, not connected to anything these four OR gates, so this is getting synthesized here. This guy is getting synthesized here. And this guy is getting synthesized here. And none of them have the inputs of I0. So I0 doesn't really matter here. So is I0 actually present in the encoder ICs? It is there provided as an input so the user may connect it to something or may not connect it to something. But it is not useful for a binary encoder. However, for a slightly more advanced encoder, which also monitors whether you have at least one of them being active or all of them are inactive, in that case, I0 will matter. So you will see later versions of encoders, which are slightly more advanced. In that, it will, it will matter. For right now, for the basic encoder, it's not playing a role. All right, so now let's try to look at how many times. So we have got 12 more minutes. What I want to do in this time is at least start talking about the priority encoder. So we'll do the small size first. We'll do a four to two, but in this case, I will do a priority encoder. I've got four inputs, two outputs, but I'm also going to uh, monitor certain expressions. So I'll, I'll talk more about that in just a bit. I have got three in four inputs here. Uh, I3, I2, I1, I0. I've got two outputs, Y1, Y0, all of them active high. And then I'm also going to monitor row expressions. So one possibility is I0 is active, everybody is inactive. The other, the next possibility is I1 is active, I2 is inactive, I3 is inactive, but by accident, I0 could be active. The next possibility is I2 is active, I3 is inactive, 
but by accident maybe on purpose maybe by accident i1 or i0 became active so i i i don't care about that they are x they could be 0 could be 1 the last case here is i3 is active all the others are don't cares how should i encode these situations for the first one i0 is active i'm going to encode that as decimal 0 or 00, zero. in the next case i1 is active encode that as 1 encode that as 2 encode that as 3 now i want you guys to look at how the priority is being assigned priority when you say priority encoder how are you coming up with this priority priority is being given to the most significant active input significant active input for example if you have i2 is active and i3 is inactive that's it you have to give priority to i2 you don't even care about what is below that you don't give priority to them you don't even consider them you will give priority to the most significant active input for example if your i3 is active that's it you don't even care about what's what's below that so that's what you are we are assigning priority as priority is being given to the most active most significant active input now let's talk about row expressions because eventually what i want to do is be able to write a logic expression for y0 and a logic expression for y1 for that i will need some row expressions so for row expressions i will use uh, h0 h1 h2 h3 think of it as intermediate signals is that does this simplify the logic I, a little bit uh, but that's not the purpose though the the, the reason for doing this is to uh, make sure that even though the user commits a mistake right you see there's only one input had to be active and the user was taking that responsibility to make sure that happens but if they make two two inputs active you only have to count it once like you only have to count one of them which one are you going to count the most significant one right so it's it's mainly done to alleviate some of the responsibilities of the user all right let's go back here all right so i want to monitor row expressions h0 what is that well it is i3 has to be a 0 i2 has to be a 0 i1 has to be a 0 i0 has to be a 1 for h1 i'm just writing expressions for each row for h1 i3 is a 0 i2 is a 0 i1 is a 1 i don't care about i0 for h2 i3 complement and i1 uh, sorry i2 for the last one simply i3 so now we are ready to write the expressions for output y0 and y1 y0 is what uh, i've got a one here and a one here so h1 plus h2 uh, h3 For y1, y, uh, h2 plus h3. But as you can see, it is following the same pattern, right? 1, 3, 5, 7, 2, 3, 6, 7. If you had a bigger one, you would go uh, for y2, you would have uh, h4, 5, 6, 7. Instead of inputs, now we have row expressions. Instead of i's, you have h. That's it, that's the only difference. 
but those H's are where that priority is being implemented. Now let's also make a note about active high active low. Uh, this is this is enabled. We are looking at an enabled uh, one, uh, enabled priority encoder, and all are active high, right? The same thing over here. We wanted this to be enabled and all are active high. All are active high. All right. Questions about the truth table for the 4 to 2 priority encoder. So where does this priority encoder or basic encoder or um, any kind of encoder, where does it come in to picture, right? In a, in a real application, where do you see this? Well, if you have a system, right, where multiple uh, people are coming in to request a service, and suppose they are asked to take a number, right? So whoever comes first, they, they press a button and a specific number gets assigned to them. So that could be a real application where you see this play out. So there are N lines. One of these guys comes in, presses a button. So for example, request number three, the uh, requester number three comes in, presses a button, and he would get a number assigned to, 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 to that person, right? So that would be 0, 1, 1, for example. So it's like, uh, you know, something that you see at a DMV uh, or a place of public service like that, right? Where you're going in, you press, you take a tag, you get a number, right? So that's like pressing for a service and you're getting a number to put you into a queue. That would be a, a real application of where this plays out. And over here, because of that application, making sure that only one person is active at any given time, you get that sequential, uh, you get one after the other. But if there was an application in which more than one user was able to make things active, then you would need a priority encoder in that case. So if you expand that 4 to 2 encoder to a 8 to 3 priority encoder, this is how things look like. You still have active high inputs, active low outputs. There is also another output called idle, which is essentially to indicate whether you got something or you didn't get something at the input side. I'll talk more about that. But these are your eight inputs, active high inputs, these are your eight, uh, three outputs. H, as we did, it is reflecting a row expression. We did it for a smaller size. Now you have a bigger size. So H7 is I7. In our case, we stopped at H3, which was just I3. But if you see the pattern here, how this is going backwards, I3 followed by I3 complement I2, followed by I3 complement I2 complement I1, and all the way back until you get I0. That's exactly what is happening over here. I7, I7 complement I6, I7 complement I6 complement I5, all the way down to H0, in which you get I0. So those are your row expressions that are dependent on the eight inputs, followed by the expressions for the outputs. We just did uh, the smaller case, right? Like we did just, just this, this much. But in our case, now we are going for that eight to three, bigger one, right? So one, three, five, seven here, two, three, six, seven there, four, five, six, seven there for the most significant active high output. 
but also the difference is earlier we had i's now we have the row expression h idle is an output which is monitoring did you get something here or not is any one of them active or not the way you find idle output is or all of the inputs and complement them and by using the morgan's law you can also express it like this is this active and this is one of them is it active or not so idle output is also called sometimes as the got something output you got something did you get something for this chip or not again very useful in cascading encoders all right so we'll we'll stop here we'll pick up with the standard 74x1488 input priority encoder in the next class so that's coming up on friday so the plan for friday is to wrap up priority encoders uh, sorry encoders in general uh, try to wrap up the tri-state buffers and then we will uh, try to start our conversation on multiplexers another very interesting topic no problem i will see you guys on friday <laughs>